fund me, I would not have to fund them, but I did get a lot of records to identify, and that seems to hunt me all the time, so I can't escape. And uh, quite a lot of uh, my research years I've spent in Australia, and there I have a very good experience with consulting for terrestrial mining, and um, I have to tell you that it was a very nice experience, and I, I don't know how other mining companies are, but in Australia, the legislation is quite good, so um, I got to identify many records, and identifying it's not such a big issue, it's okay, but they were also very good to find the publication of these uh, new, mostly new species, and at the end, after maybe two years of full-time project, I ended up with a major monograph describing all circles from one major mining part in Australia, which is the Pilbara region, in Western Australia. And today that modern work is something that you, you use and all the consulting agencies are using to identify all circles down to the species level. Of course they tend to find new species, but when you have a publication with, which contains 100 described species from certain, re from certain region, then the, that makes the job much more easier for mining companies and for contractors. So, although in Australia this is not uh, it's not ideal situation, I think that Australian examples should be taken in account when dealing with and assessing biodiversity and impacts on the environment. And I'm sure that, uh, and unfortunately, that rarity of species or endemic species will probably never stop mining, but it's our due as humans to contribute to the knowledge of fauna and as much as we can because we are only one species living on this planet. So uh, I will give you some general information on all the nostrils. And I will try to emphasize the diversity and bear in mind this is a class. So unfortunately, I would like to talk about families, but talking about ostrich families is um, it's almost impossible. So I will try to use as few names as possible for now because it just gets mixed in your mind. So these are some interesting things. So the class was made by a French scientist in 1802. But it comes from a Greek word, ostrapo, which means shell or tile. And uh, there are common names in different languages, and for one in English it's mussel shrimps or sea shrimps. Um, what, what I can tell about ostracos is that they live in every possible aquatic habitat on the planet, from terrestrial puddles to um, abyssal depths. And they come, they're a very old group, they're one of the oldest crustacean groups. They date from about 500 million years ago, and then this is adding to, its, to the um, evolutionary history of the group, and it gives you uh, an overview how diverse morphological group can get in 500 million years. Uh, and previously, People wanted to fit them somewhere, so it was a part of the class Maxilopoda, which by itself is probably, probably polyphyletic. But currently, ostracods are recognized as one of the seven classes of the final crustacea, and this is also giving you uh, an indication how morphologically diverse this group is. Currently, it's divided into two subclasses, in the subclass Myodocopa and Podocopa. So here is a brief, this is more systematics for you, and you can see that I have only, I have only went down to the suborder level, and I have tried to give a photo for uh, each of the suborder representatives. As you can see, quite diverse group, but what is common to all of them is that they are um, enclosed between two strongly calcified valves. And actually, that calcification is what provides such a rich fossil record because ostracods are one of the major, one of the most dominant microfossils uh, in the sediments. So here you can see two valves, one, two. This one is laying on its back, and the valves are dorsally connected together with one hinge, and this hinge can be quite elaborate with 
teeth and pockets and holes. So it's a very good ergonomic feature. And inside, this is very good, they have a um, almost unsegmented body. So whatever uh, primitive arthropods have had, so segmentation, osteopods has have lost almost entire segmentation. There are some remnants, but those are always considered as primitive characters. And what is very good for lazy taxonomists is that they have few appendages, so not many legs to dissect, and uh, that makes the job a little bit easier. Uh, however, uh, between the two subclasses, there is a huge morphological difference. So here I'm showing you a subclass, Myodocopa, uh, which has up to seven appendages labeled here. Um, some even have fewer, which is even better. Uh, and they are characterized by a much weaker classification of the shell. So what you find, find in fossil record would probably most likely not be Myodocopa, but the representatives of the uh, second subclass. And this is one of their characteristics. This is their second antenna. So uh, bear in mind I'm just pointing out this uh, feature because this is quite different between these two subclasses. So in this subclass, the second antenna consists of a very large, uh, very, very small endocodite. So the endocodite is this piece here. And a very long exocodite. On the other hand, in another subclass, also, you have up to seven appendages, and they're all conservative morphologically among each other. And uh, shell, as I said, is much strongly calcified, so you are very likely to find them in fossil record. But look at this second antenna here. So it's a complete opposite ratio between exopodite and endopodite. So here you have a very long endopodite, but a very short, sometimes even missing exopodite. So the question is, are they polyphyletic? <laughs> Probably they are. There are many uh, proof going in that direction. So, for example, you saw the, the second antenna. Other examples are that they are different in their ontogeny. So, Marlopopa, they don't have nuclear, nuclear larvae. They already have, when they hatch, they are at the metanuclear stage. So, already five to six appendages. And they only go through five moltings before they reach adulthood, while in Protocopa they have two nucleus with only three, rarely there are four appendages, and most often they have eight instars between, uh, until they reach the adulthood. Another thing which is indicating the polyphyletic nature of the class is that the position of the most posterior appendage, known as furca, in Mycocopa it is dorsal to the anus, while in Protocopa it is ventral to the anus. There are some molecular studies also indicating polyphyly of osteopods. However, the uh, taxon sampling is still very poor, so resolution is not good. And of course, the striking differences in morphology. This is the size. So they go from 0.2 millimeters. So I have to disappoint you, mesh size needs to be smaller for osteopods. But Mostly in deep sea, you won't find the small osteopods anyway, so don't be bothered. And they can go up to 3 centimeters. So where do you fit them? Are they male fauna or macrofauna organisms? This is another thing about osteopods. They are both. You can find them in male fauna samples, you can find them in macrofauna samples as well. Diversity, 65,000 names for fossil species. Huge number. 80,000 recent, and mind you this between brackets, it says living under question mark, because for most osteopodologists, living means that they have their shell and their soft parts described together, while when you say recent, it doesn't necessarily mean that the soft parts have been described, so it might be that they are only known after their shell. The majority of fossil species belong to the suborder Citrocopina, so the subclass for the copa, well calcified subclass. And this Citrocopina is actually a group of osteopods which contains two thirds of the entire diversity of the 
uh, of the class of Stricola. Ostracods are very broadly used because of their rich fossil record. So in paleo uh, ecological studies, uh, for example, the ratio between magnesium, magnesium and calcium is indicator of paleo temperature. The ratio between strontium and calcium is indicator of salinity. You can use them to detect past human activities or to detect some pollution from seasonal changes. So great applications in paleo environmental studies. So this set faces here just to indicate that uh, shell is actually ostrich shell is uh, where the economic problem starts. Start and the shell is actually the thing that most people look into when they talk about and uh, when they try to identify ostracons. Shell needs to be addressed with special care because shell does have uh, lots of taxonomic information. First, it can be very nicely ornamented in different way, ways. It have, can be colorful depending on the environment where an organism lives. Uh, it can have different levels of classification, which I already mentioned, uh, but also has different morphology when you look at it from the in inside. Uh, also, there is that hinge, which can have many teeth and pockets and things like that. So, why are we fussing when we have so much information and why do we have to look into soft parts? Well, unfortunately, uh, well, well, shell is well known to have many homoplastic characters. So you can find similar or the same characteristic in different taxa, in different species. Because shell often mirrors the environmental condition. This is to be expected. Because if you imagine shell is exposed to the environmental condition, to the pressure of the environment, inside there are soft parts and they are protected. So what is going to react first to the changes is going to be the shell. So, and uh, other thing is that most of the osteopodologists today are paleontologists and their knowledge contributed to the osteopodology a great deal, but often paleontologists lack the biological background in their education, so they uh, don't have clear understanding of these processes of speciation, uh, how do we classify and why do we classify species in different genera in taxonomic units. So this is resulting that current systematics of most abundant group uh, is not based on phylogeny but it's rather on kinetics and sometimes on stratigraphy. And another result is that paleontological and neontological classifications are rarely in accordance. And this is just one example. So this is a Zipidase which is a common species and it's not a deep sea species. You can find it living from completely marine environment to almost uh, fresh water. And depending where does it live, it has different nodules on its shell. And this is only one example. So you have these examples across the entire class. And now to address uh, our common interest today, it's deep sea, deep sea ostracods and the history very briefly. It started like with many uh, groups at a time with Challenger Expedition in 1870 and data for came, uh, came from Brady and Brady in 1880 published uh, a monograph and uh, in that monograph he described 150 new species and new genera. So this uh, figure here is showing how Brady used to identify them. Uh, of course, at the time, the level of taxonomic knowledge was not as good as today, so it was really enough to look only into the shell, so all of his um, illustrations are only on certain shells. And uh, he concluded that most of the species are cosmopolitan, and that there is a relatively low diversity in comparison to the number of samples and what he saw. This one is a challenger summary from Ari in 1895 and it's showing that the number of species drastically goes with death, which is true for ostracons as well. Uh, since Brady's time and into late 70s, uh, the research on deep sea ostracons has
have been going on and it was quite active. Uh, and some is relatively abundant from the late 70s. However, they are mostly based on the shells obtained from the sediments and in many cases, these species are considered recent, so they are not fossil species. But soft parts were never considered. Why? Because there is a tendency of very low abundance of ostracals, so number of living specimens per square meter, and also there is inadequacy of the sampling techniques, and another third thing, which is not mentioned here, laziness. Okay, so generally deep sea ostracal assemblages are composed of several photocopied lineages, so well calcified ostracals, with predominancy of the soup order Citeropopina. So here there are very few today, very few um, studies of living uh, deep sea ostracals. By living, I mean that we have complete data, we know how its shell looks like, uh, their shell looks like, and how the soft parts look like. So I'm going to give you two examples. This is suborder Cardiopina. These are from the subclass Myrtocopa, which is less calcified ostracod, but these ones are exceptions because they have relatively well calcified <coughs> shells. And they only have one family, so luckily they are only one family, family polycopita. And uh, they look like this, so generally like little balls with different ornamentations on their, of their characters. Um, and you can say that they are one of the most abundant deep sea ostracal groups in paleo uh, environmental and paleoecological studies. And they constitute more than 50% of all ostracal taxa taken for these kinds of studies. However, look at this, they are all identified only as polycopy SPP. No wonder, when you see a ball, well, what can you say? There is a polycopy, it can be this and it can be that, but let's leave it, let's leave it as a polycopy SPP. The first living deep sea polycopy species was described in the late 70s from Kuril Kamchatka Trench, and in that description, only from a single sample, a guy, um, uh, Chatgur, uh, described uh, nine species, and these species were all known from the depths greater than 2,500 meters. Uh, then we had a chance to look at the samples coming from the Diva 2 expedition uh, that was part of the census of marine life and the samples were taken from the South Atlantic Ocean and only from a handful of uh, samples we were able to find 40 new species and, but we described only 9 species, 1 new genus and 1 new subgenus. Why only 9 species out of 14? because there were not enough material. So there were only maybe two or three specimens, so this is what we, would ever, we were able to pull out from these samples. But we were also able now to look and to compare some deep sea regions of the world and to tell more specifically how ostracods are distributed in deep sea. So here you can see a list of four species of polycopic ostracods so far found in the deep sea. And from what this genus, Metapolycope, three out of six species, the, the red stars are representing deep sea uh, species, so three out of six are exclusively deep, deep sea animals. From Archipolycope, so this one here, all are deep sea ostracods. Pseudopolycope, three out of 15 are deep sea, and this is the subgenus which we described. Uh, uh, three out of four species are deep sea. So what are these results telling us? So, first of all, there might be some endemic deep sea genera, but endemism on the genus level, at least, uh, uh, is the family polycopida, so one of the most abundant uh, families in the deep sea, uh, is, uh, is not, they are not restricted to, certain, to only one ocean. However, as far as species are concerned, we are concerned we have not found widely, widely distributed species. But, I mean, look at this. These are really like not even drops in the ocean. This is less than drops. So you have 
so poor data that it's hard to draw any conclusion. This is only like in our more, more our imagination than really based on some uh, good data. So the the most the data are published in this paper, and this paper might be useful useful for you because we have here keys to all genera and to all species for this abundant family, so it can be really useful. This is another example where we studied both uh, uh, soft parts and shell. And this one comes from a very interesting habitat, from driftwood. Uh, and th that one was collected during the Columbia expedition on the board of German research vessel Zone, from Kuril Kamchatka Trench in Old West Pacific as well. So uh, from about, about 5,000 meters, they pulled out a lot of different branches, trees, but uh, the only one which actually brought uh, a, an abundant uh, animal, uh, in a diverse animal taxa, is the fresh looking uh, piece, which was birch-like tree. And we also found ostracods there. And the ostracods are not these, the, uh, the uh, ostracods from driftwood found during these expeditions are not the first data. They were already known. For example, the first deep sea wood dwelling ostracods were described from experimental pieces of wood laid in Bahamas and Panama, basin from 2,000 to 4,000 meters. And several species are found on the same wood pieces, and many of the species were found in different wood, uh, wood pieces that were spread 1,000 kilometers apart, which is telling you that they are not really localized fauna. But this is also a good thing to bear in mind when you go sampling, go sampling. Maybe it's a good idea to lay down by the traps. Maybe that's the way to track more animals and then pull the diversity and detect diversity better with like less effort. Uh, and what these guys found is that ostracod fauna is similar to communities found in living in shallow water algae and marine grass, uh, but that they are endemic to deep sea habitats and in fact they have described an endemic genus for these habitats. They think and they're probably right that they are transported from one island to another by currents or by carrying, uh, being carried on another animal. Wood dwelling ostracods may be able to reach new wood pieces also to their hosts because some of the ostracods are symbiotic uh, on isopods, especially. And this is the result of our finding, and this paper. Which, is just, which just came out, is also very good for you because it has a key to families of this famous, notorious, uh, most abundant uh, podocopy group, Citrocopina, which constitutes